K Beezy, you fired up. Yeah, nowadays I get what I want. Lately been spinning a bag. Addicted to getting that cash. Addicted to popping them tags. Money was made for the sad. Now my ex bitch calling back. Saw me come up out the road. Hello and welcome to episode 29 of the Roadie Rumble podcast. My name is Adam Bernstein. Today I'm joined by Jack O'Mara. Jack is an alumni of the University of Rhode Island. He's currently serving as a senior accountant executive at Spectra for the Ryan Center here on campus. How are we doing today, Jack? I'm doing great, Adam. Thanks so much for having me on the Roadie Rumble. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I want to start with a little bit about your background, how you got into sports, uh, your major, you know, why you wanted to pursue the University of Rhode Island and really sports media in general. Yeah, sure. So it it kind of all started for me um, senior year of high school when I was trying to figure out, you know, where to go to school. I was touring colleges, applying to different schools, and I I was kind of narrowing down to schools where that had a a larger selection of majors because I was still a little bit unsure. Um, and, And I was weighing my options in. You know, sports is something that I've always been uh, super involved with, always had a big passion for, um, you know, I played football, baseball throughout high school, and uh, I loved every aspect of it. And I knew that I wasn't as athletically gifted, um, you know, uh, not a, not the tallest guy in the world, and not the, the athletic prowess that you need to play at the next level. So I knew that, you know, my, my athletic career is going to end um, in high school, and I didn't want to uh, step away from sports whatsoever. And I started to look at different avenues that I can get involved in. One that stuck out to me was sports media and sports broadcasting. I'd always had a fascination for, you know, the production, both on the television and radio side of things. And, you know, I started to listen to different broadcasters uh, throughout my senior year of high school. I said, this, this is something that I could really, uh, you know, do. And, and it's very interesting. It's very exciting to be, you know, working hands-on in this field. And, uh, one of my big inspirations to get into it was Doc Emmerich. You know, he, he was so influential to me as a big hockey uh, guy and, and really started to really like the sport and enjoy the sport um, in high school. So um, he was a big push for me. And then I chose URI because uh, I really liked the location. Right. For me, it was only about a two and a half hour drive from my hometown. Um, so far enough away where I could get out of my hometown, but close enough, you know, if I ever needed to go back, I could. Um, I love the location in Rhode Island, and, and I really saw, um, you know, a positive light uh, on the program that was being built there in, in the Harrington School and, you know, the growth of the sports media uh, major now, obviously, is, is influential and, and tremendous. And, uh, you know, I really saw that it's, it was something that could be built up from the ground, and it was, it was moving at 100 miles an hour, and I wanted to jump on board with that. So that was kind of a, a helping decision, and, and Adam Roth, who was the interim director at the time, was a, a big part in that in helping me, you know, finalize that decision to come to URI. So, you know, I went in there, and I, I chose communication studies because I felt it was the, the closest to what I wanted to accomplish, and, you know, it took off from there. Yeah, you know, everything you mentioned uh, before we talked a little bit before we started recording uh, about, you know, URI and just the sports media program. Um, And I mentioned, you know, Stone Freeman, you, Nick Carty, just a couple of names. Uh, You know, you look around the WRIU office and you guys sort of paved the way for the next generation of sports media students like myself. Um, And everything you mentioned about coming to URI, I'm originally from Long Island, New York, but I remember back in 2019 when the sports media program really in the Harrington School was starting to heat up and pick up a little bit. I remember coming to URI and shadowing, I think I did uh, like a day in the life of a student in Harrington Mm -hmm. School. It was really cool to see the opportunities and sitting in the uh, former Dean Adam Roth's office, having that one-on-one conversation with him. Um, And really, you know, that day I I made my decision that I was going to come to the University of Rhode Island. So everything you said right there, I, I can definitely agree with. Yeah, it is interesting how a lot of the uh, the, the great students who have, who have come through that program and are in that program right now have very similar stories, right? Because uh, you're all shaped very similarly and uh, similar aspirations and goals. And I got to tell you, Adam Roth, you know, for the time that he was with the Harrington School, he did an excellent job at, at really selling the school, being an ambassador for the Harrington School and the university to, to get some students who are, you know, not only dedicated, but highly talented at what they do. And, and I can already tell that you're one of those guys who's got to be, you know, following up that list. So, um, you know, it, it, he, he did a tremendous job and, and the program's going to keep going. I appreciate that. I mean, going off of that, really, um, I think a lot of us sports media guys have the same mindset. What I was saying before um, was that, you know, I'm, I kind of, 
describe myself in a way that I think a lot of other people can relate to in this program. You know, I'm a go-getter. So for instance, like this podcast, the articles that I write, uh, even WRU, those are things that, you know, instructors or professors are not necessarily teaching in classes. You know, they're trying to help us get those opportunities, but I feel like in this major, it's so important to be a go-getter and grind and try and go after uh, the opportunities and create opportunities for yourself rather than, you know, always trying to seek it. You know, I, I'm friends with a couple of business majors, for example, and they're always, you know, applying to these big firms and, and stuff like that. Um, and I feel like it's a lot different in this major because you're able to kind of create opportunities for yourself. And then who knows? I mean, your podcast could get picked up mm -hmm. then within the next day by a network and that could become your job. So I think it's just being able to create opportunities for yourself um, and create positions that or roles that weren't even jobs 10 mm -hmm. years ago. That's what's so special about this uh, industry. So I definitely agree with what you were saying right there. Yeah, you have to be creative, especially when you're at the college age, because you not only, you know, it's it would be great if, if your podcast hits the ground running and somebody picks it up and, and you could do that, you know, as a profession. But it's also important to do things like this to, to get your repetitions right. You know, they say practice makes perfect. It's the same thing for uh, this you know, this focal point, this, this area of work. And, and I think it, it's super important, you know, getting involved with the radio station, writing articles for the cigar, the anchor sports network, doing your own thing where you're just, you know, on the fly, you're interviewing different people, you're getting, you know, bits and pieces from all over the place. It, it's super important because it gives you that, that extra, you know, practice that you won't necessarily get in the classroom like you said that i always said when i was in school the classrooms laying the foundation for you right you're getting your good schooling you know you're learning all these di different little styles and and tips and tricks and you can apply that to your work but when you're actually out there when you're actually interviewing somebody when you're actually you know doing play-by-play -play or you're actually physically writing an article covering a game that's when you're really going to learn from your mistakes you're going to learn from what, what you're doing very well and you're going to you know keep moving forward and, and kind of build on that as well 100 percent uh so going off of that i mean you talk about the things that you do outside of the classroom but really what stems your your motivation what is your why what motivates you? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, the constant want to get better, to better yourself and to reach your goals. You know, I set very high goals and aspirations for myself. And, and eventually I would like to call a, a major four final, whether that be in the NBA, the NHL, the Super Bowl, the, the World Series. Uh, th that's that's my ultimate goal. And I understand that it's a, it's a very high ask and it's, it's a, a, a large of almost insurmountable goal, but I, I think that I can achieve it. And I, and I look at other people and in the industry, you know, who are currently broadcasting, you know, just some absolute legends that you can watch every week, like Gus Johnson and Kevin Harlan. And uh, I love Kenny Albert. I think he does an excellent job. You know, so many guys across the, the different sports and platforms, you, you look, you look up to them and you see different things that they do. And, and that kind of pushes you, right? Oh, I want to try that. I want to take that style or I want to take that little phrase, how he, you know, pictured that. And just the way that they can turn the, the game that's happening in front of you on the screen or in your ears, right into this, this larger story that, that really encompasses everything that's going on there on the field or on the court. So I think that, you know, watching those guys and, and my own aspirations kind of combination of the two, you know, definitely pushes me every day to, to get better and, and to achieve, you know, what hopefully will be a very large goal. Absolutely. Actually, it's funny you mentioned that because my next question that I was going to transition to was who's someone that you look up to and you mentioned a handful of names right there. Uh, me being a New York Yankees fan, I'm originally from Long Island. So mm -hmm. Going to uh, school in New England is, is very challenging, but I'm, I'm a big Yankees fan, so I look up to John nice. Sterling. Yes. Uh, and now I'm involved in the radio, I look up to John Sterling and a little bit of Michael K, stuff like mm -hmm. that. So uh, more on a personal note for you, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, legends in the broadcast, booth, mm -hmm. but who is someone that you look up to more on a personal level, um, whether that be a family member or someone that's over you that sort of mentored you and, you know, helped you become the broadcaster that you are today? Yeah, I think, it, you know, it's, it's a combination of people, 
right? I, I have such a good support system with my family. Uh, my mom and dad from, from day one, they would never, you know, tell me, oh, you're going to do this. You know, we're going to do that. They would say, do what you want to do and whatever that you choose that we're going to push you to, to do the best. Uh, and it started for, from day one, they have been so, so helpful and, um, you know, a, a supportive of everything that I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, I, I look up to them because they're, they're my biggest role models. They work time and time again, like in, in their specific fields, like every single day. And, and I kind of got that work ethic from them. And then, you know, in the industry specifically, it, it was, it was great to, you know, kind of grow up and, and learn alongside, you know, with some of the people that you name Stone Freeman, Nick Cardi, uh, Nikki Laterulo, Kate Rogerson, all these people that, you know, I like graduated with and uh, worked hands on in the field with, uh, they are kind of a, we're our, our own support system. And, you know, everyone's off doing their own different things now, whether they're across the country in Oregon or, or right here in Little Rhodey, you know, working back with the, the University of Rhode Island. So it's, it's really cool to see uh, everyone's successes. And, um, you know, seeing them grow and seeing them achieve what they achieve, you know, that's, that's a role model in themselves, right? You know, I want to be as good as they are. I want to do what they're doing. So, you know, that, that's something I, I look up to as well is the people around me who I grew up, you know, learning this, this field with. So them, my parents, my family, it's, it's been, uh, you know, a tremendous support system for me. I can't be more grateful. Yeah. And I have to go back to your original point about just always trying to be better and always trying to improve. Like, that's something that I really take seriously, um, mm -hmm. especially in you know my work ethic and the things that I do. I always want to be better. I'm never really satisfied. I always, I'm always embarrassed to listen back to my WRID <laughs> broadcast, but I always try and listen mm -hmm. and go back and see you know what I could have said or what I did better. I did, uh, I guess, what was football yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. um, I no no two days ago. Two I years. did. Uh, the URI Delaware game play by play for WRU. And I had uh, Will Pipicillio as my color. And, you know, during halftime after the end of each quarter, he was kind of guiding me through it. And, you know, I'll try and, you know, not ask me this question as much, try and say this more, refer back to the time and um, how many timeouts are left on each mm -hmm. side, stuff like that. You know, talk about the formation that the offense and the defense are in just little things like that. I'm mm -hmm. always trying to improve yeah. upon. Uh, and then just going back to what you said about, you know, your family and how, you have such a great support system. I can't agree more. Um, you know, I know people back home that have told me like, really, you want to be like on ESPN, you want to be like those guys behind the booth. And I'm like, yeah, like, and I think it, a lot of people just don't really understand um, because they're not doing it. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have that support system around me. And, you know, it's great. Again, I mentioned it earlier, but walking around that uh, office, the WRIU office, which uh, between you and me both should be pretty cleaned out. Uh, it's, it hasn't <laughs> been uh, updated hey, in a couple hey, of years. It's, uh, uh, you know, that, that's part of the, the creative <laughs> freedom that, that the WRU students have is, yeah. is, is making that office their own. And believe yep. me, it's, it's been like that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, my, my dad went to URI um, and I was showing him a couple of weeks back on, on Parents Weekend, you know, because now I'm in this role as a sports director and he's like wow like, and he graduated in 87 he's like mm -hmm. wow it almost looks the same <laughs> and i'm yeah. not surprised so um but yeah no just literally walking around that office and around the studio and i feel like there's a story you know like mm -hmm. everyone that has been in that office or in that studio you know you have the pictures up there um and really you know i feel like now it's time for the next generation to kind of look back and kind of pave their own path and you mentioned kind of branching out to different areas, whether that be in Oregon or working for uh, here at URI or anything like that. So it's definitely something that I'm looking to get into um, and everything you mentioned there, I, I definitely agree with. But moving on to the next question I have, I mean, mm -hmm. sort of touched upon it, but I definitely want to put more emphasis on your college experience, and just the things that you accomplished in your college career. You know, so talk to me about your college experience. You know, what are some organizations you mentioned WRU? Mm -hmm. uh, other organizations that you were involved with while you were here at URI? So. Yeah, sure. WRU is my big one, obviously. I wanted to get involved with them right away because they were, you know, the, the sports broadcasting department. It's, it was right up my alley. It's what I wanted to do. Got involved with them right away. Um, you know, the first month of, of being there as a freshman and, you know, started calling hockey games and women's soccer games, softball games. It worked my way up to to the 90.3 FM dial um, as a freshman, which was pretty cool. 
but I, uh, I also got involved uh, with the URI tour guiding program. Uh, I, I wanted to have a job focused on campus, right, where I could, you know, fill in the gaps of my, my schedule in between classes, doing broadcasts, and uh, tour guiding jumped out at me because, again, it was another opportunity for me to develop my public speaking skills and, you know, be in front of an audience and, and do different things, right? Uh, it, it's so many similarities between that and, and doing a broadcast because uh, it's never the same thing, right? We have a scripted tour, but every single time I did it, it was a different sounding tour, right? I use different phrases and words and describe things in different ways. So that was really cool. I also learned how to walk backwards uh, like a professional as well. So that was that was an entertaining part of my life, but a great community there. Really, really good, strong community. Great people that I met through there. Um, you know, it just, it was one of those things that, that complemented everything that I was doing really well. And I wrote for the cigar for a year. Um, I guess sports journalism wasn't my biggest thing, you know, writing never really one of my, my most favorite things to do, but I wanted to do it for a year. I wanted to just get some, you know, foundational things there and, and learn that side of the business. You know, I've always kind of been focused on sports broadcasting, but I think one of the things that you have to be, especially nowadays is dynamic and, and have multiple things that you can lean on. Oh, I've written press releases. I've written, you know, feature articles, interviews, this, that, and the other thing. Those complement your, you know, main resume, what you, you're trying to build. Um, and when you go out in the, in the real world and are looking for jobs, um, you, you know, employers, job hirers, they're going to look at you and see what else can you do more than what we're just asking you to do. And they're likely going to turn to the person who has all these other little skills like graphic design and ability to write and all these different little things. They'll look to you first over somebody who's just kind of right there. I've got the main skill, but I don't have a lot of other things to go along. So kind of off track there, but um, yeah, I, I was involved with the tour guiding program, worked with the cigar, did a little work with the Anchor Sports Network. You know, it was still relatively new when I was there. So I, I helped out uh, my senior year with them. Um, you know, the, the organization founded by uh, some good friends of mine, Joe DeLeon and, and Sean Anderson, who are also off doing big and better things. Um, you know, they, they've done a really good, nice job in, in the podcasting industry for, for sports media, especially covering uh, FCS football. So th they've done a really good job and they did a great job, you know, finding that organization. So just kind of did a bunch of little things and I was heavily involved with intramurals. Again, I, I love sports. I love playing sports. Can't take the competitive nature out of me, you know, almost got ejected out of an intramural volleyball game, but that's beside the point. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just all part of the fun. So I, I filled my schedule pretty well, um, you know, with different things. And that, that's what you have to do in college is, is try to, you know, maximize your, your time there. Because I'll say it to everybody I talk to, best four years of your life, fastest four years of your life. Can't agree more. Uh, I hate to say I'm a junior now. It's, it sucks because my sophomore year was covid um, but I can't agree more. And I think the biggest thing that stuck with me with what you just said was just always kind of keeping yourself busy. That's like mm -hmm. one of my biggest things. Cause I feel like, you know, the workload at times, and maybe you can agree in certain, some of these classes, obviously during midterm midterms and final exams, like it heats up, but there are times like throughout the semester where I really just don't have that much homework mm -hmm. and I just don't really like it. Like it drives me crazy. Like I want to try and give myself homework, like stuff like this, mm -hmm. trying to book guests to come on my podcast, uh, writing articles about, you know, the URI men's basketball team or even the women's basketball team who's starting to see some success. Like, you know, always trying to find things that I can do that I consider, you know, my homework, not necessarily that's assigned to me, but I, I kind mm -hmm. of, that I kind of assign to myself. So I think that's the biggest thing. Uh, and I also got to say that the tour guiding is very impressive. I, I sit in the library and I watch them walk backwards, like right past me. I don't know how they do that. So I give you a lot of credit for, for doing that for uh, however long you did that. That's definitely a skill that I could not do. Yeah, I, I did it for all four years, actually. And, uh, okay. you know, it takes a lot of uh, bruising and, and bumping into poles into people, too. And, you know, it, you just kind of look around and you say, oh, hope 
too many people going to laugh at me, but it's, it's all part of the fun. And, you know, if you're filling your schedule and, and doing those things, you're, you're gonna, you know, again, maximize your experience. You're going to make the most of it. And, you know, it's always good once in a while to, to have nothing on your plate, right? Sometimes in this industry, you're, you're bogged down with articles and, and games. And once the, you know, basketball season really picks up, you've got a lot going on. So it is nice every once in a while to have a day where you can just kind of, you know, decompress, recharge the batteries, but um, no, it's, it's a very good thing that you fill your plate with a bunch of different things to, to kind of all come together for you. Definitely agree. Uh, going back to WRIU, if you had to mm -hmm. pinpoint a favorite memory, I know there's probably hundreds, you know, and then a lot that flow through your head. And, um, but, you know, one that comes to mind or a story that you'd like to share uh, from your time at WRIU, you know, what would that be that you could share? Yeah, I would say it was the first trip that I made uh, with the crew is is uh, to Washington D.C. for the 2018 um, Atlantic 10 Championship. Uh, that that was a, a truly incredible time, and uh, it was at that point where you know I was still on the younger side, like looking up to some of the older guys there, Ben Kinch, Sam Murray. Um, you know, we, we were kind of in the thick of it, and. Um, you know, our, our relationships were, were almost professional at that point, right? We didn't kind of break into this, you know, kind of friendship circle quite yet. And, and that trip kind of changed that, right? It was, it was us, it, you know, we had a couple other people here with us and um, it, was, it was great. Stone was there and, and we just kind of all bonded, right? We all stayed in the same hotel room. We were walking around, you know, seeing the different monuments and, and, and really taking in the experience, right? We were there to, to call the, all the games that you or I played in. They ended up making it to the final against Davidson. They lost. Um, I think it was a three-point game. Jeff Doughton had a chance to, to win it, or AC Matthews had a chance to win it. Either way, it was it was down to the wire, and um, it was a great experience because from there, it kind of kicked off, you know, something a little bit bigger, and, and I think that's kind of where it was like the takeoff point. But I, it's tough to narrow down all the, all the memories. I mean, just, just almost, barely, almost yelling at each other in the sports power half hour, um, you know, sports talk show that we have and, uh, you know, doing those trips. We went to uh, Washington, D.C., which was my first. And then we went to Pittsburgh for the NCAA tournament. We went to Brooklyn my senior year for, for the A-10 tournament again. And uh, Stone and I flew out to Dayton our senior year just to do one of those nice uh, road trips. So, the, the trips were really nice and it, it was very privileged that, you know, that it was all funded through WRU and, and URI Student Senate, which was really cool. So to be able to do those and, and, and bond and, and continue to grow as a, as a broadcaster and as a sports media professional, see what it's like in those big tournament settings is it was a really cool memory that I had, um, you know, that would be possible directly through WRU. Yeah. And I think last year um, we did lose a couple of members, stuff like that. We, we have mm. since grown. Uh, with certain freshmen from last year and some of the freshmen from this year, freshmen who are now sophomores uh, that have joined the club. And we've been able to do every broadcast so far, both on the RIU2 side and also the WRIU side uh, so far this year. But I think just having, you know, missing that, uh, that experience to travel. Um, and I've heard mm -hmm. so many great stories. I, I live on Long Island. So I used to go with my dad. I think I mentioned he's an alumni of URI. Mm -hmm. So I used to go with my dad to the tournament when it was in Brooklyn. Um, but, you know, I never really noticed uh, WRIU there because that was back when, before I, you know, got to the University of Rhode yeah. Island. Now that I'm with the club, I'm with the organization, I'd love to be a part of that and travel. Mm -hmm. I know we're supposed to travel to uh, UMass when we play them in football. Mm -hmm. um, have to make sure that's good with their SID first. But, uh, <laughs> you know, hopefully we're able to have those experiences and mm -hmm. uh, travel to the tournaments and do stuff like that because, you know, there's one thing calling a home game for your school, but I think another thing uh, from a broadcaster standpoint is being able to call a game on the road. Um, I think it just teaches a lot of life lesson because, you know, this is something that I want to take on mm -hmm. in, in my path in sports media as a career. I'm going to have to not only, you know, know how to call games from Mead Stadium and the Ryan Center, but also know how to call games from UMass or Providence. Um, that's another game we want to potentially travel to the PC game. Um, I got to watch that game my freshman year in 2019 mm. in the Ryan Center. That was still says one of the best games I've ever been to. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, getting the opportunity to travel, uh, whether that's, you know, 15 miles down the road or to Washington, D.C., mm. uh, I want to be able to do that. And I think that does teach a lot of life lessons. So 
that's awesome that you're able to share experiences like that and that you were able to kind of not only create bonds through the organization, but develop yourself as a broadcaster, uh, both on the road and at home. Yeah, you learn a lot about, you know, the, the people you're working with and you learn a lot about yourself and your capabilities. And, you know, you have to kind of learn how to live out of a suitcase, right? And, and learn to think on your toes. You know, you might not have your home office to come back to to do your game prep. You know, you might be in the hotel lobby. So I do think it, it teaches you a, a lot of cool things. Obviously, the travel aspect is cool. The, the hanging out with everyone is cool. But, you know, it does teach you a little bit more on how to, you know, branch out a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Uh, to follow that up, this may be more of a personal question uh, mm -hmm. for me, but I still want to ask it. Uh, I'm currently the uh, FM sports director for WRU. So I just wanted to know um, or get some advice uh, that you could give me on, you know, just that position. Um, Cause I'm still fairly new to it. I think mm -hmm. we're only two months into school. And then of course, just broadcasting in general advice that you have for me or maybe anybody else watching this uh, podcast. Yeah, when, when you're in the, the FM sports director position, and, and it goes for really any position that you would hold, you know, in, in any organization or, or, you know, job that you might have, if you're on a board or if you're a position of title, is I think the number one thing is communication, right? Your position is so important to talk to, you know, like you said, the visiting SID, making sure that you guys are good to go to broadcast on the road, communicating with the community DJs, making sure that, you know, in, in advance, you're letting them know, you know, hey, we've got a sport broadcast at this time on this date, you know, we're going to have to take the slot, that slot's going to be, you know, overrided and everything like that. And communicate, communicate in advance, over communicate if you have to. It's so important because if you're communicating with everyone, everyone's aware of the situation you're going in, you can reach out for help a lot easier, right? You keep those communication lines open. You state your position, what you're doing right now, People aren't going to be upset with you. People are going to be more understanding with what's going on. So I think that's such an important thing is, is to, to constantly be in communication with your board, with the people around you, with the people involved. Um, th that's, that's a really important thing. As far as, as broadcasting, I, I had the privilege to, to teach a little broadcasting course uh, my senior year Um and a, a bunch of the, uh, the WRU guys joined in and, and were my students. It was part of my honors project to graduate from the honors program at URI. Um, I taught a URI, uh, I taught a, a broadcasting seminar and, and different tips and tricks to pick up. And I, I think the biggest thing from that, um, you know, entire two semester long program that I taught was to, to stay focused, to constantly try new things and to, to look up and reference, you know, different ways that you can improve yourself. I also think one of the biggest critique points that you should do for yourself is listen back on your work. Um, I know you said it, you cringe and it, you, you hate or listening to yourself, especially when you're younger, because you make a lot of mistakes. It, it's very tough to hear yourself you know, back on, on a recording and say, wow, I, I sound weird. I, I do not like the sound of my voice being played back to me, but it's so important to grow. It's so important in the growth process to, to listen back on what you're doing. Cause you're going to say, Oh, that was really good. I liked what I did there. Or, Oh, that was horrible. I'm never doing that again. But you, you recognize, you know, what mistake you made or, or what thing you need to adjust so that when you go and fix it, you're that much closer to becoming a professional than you were before. If you just, you know, pack it up after a broadcast, say, that's it. I'm rolling to the next one. It's going to be very challenging for you to improve on your craft because you're not really sure how you're doing, right? You can say on air, oh, that didn't really sound great, blah, blah, blah. Or you could say, oh, I think I had a pretty good broadcast and listen back to it and say, wow, that was absolute garbage, you know? And it happens to everyone. It happens to me. I still have games where I'm like, I, that was not my best. I listen back. And I say, okay, I, I didn't do that well. I got to deliver that better. My timing there, my open there, whatever it might be. Listening back to your craft is such an important piece uh, in getting better every day. Definitely agree. Uh, I've started to listen back um, from last year. I always go into the archives and after I do a broadcast, make mm -hmm. sure I just save it to my computer. And then I get three hours extra of just junk that I don't need, but, you yep. know, <laughs> but that, you know, I always try and go back and I want to listen and, you know, critique what, you know, go back right. the next time I go out and make sure that I do the same thing that I did that worked and then maybe mm -hmm. improve upon something that didn't work or that I shouldn't have really said. Um, but, you know, I'm starting to do that a little bit more now with, mm -hmm. you know, radio reels, uh, putting together reels mm -hmm. and packages 
uh, want to apply for some of the internships in Providence, some of those local networks or TV stations. Mm -hmm. um, and I was talking with, I think, one of the TV anchors the other day uh, at the press conference, and I was like, no, I don't really have that much TV experience. I have a lot of radio experience. I want to put together a reel and apply for the internship next fall because I'll be a senior. And he was like, that's okay. You know, obviously, I had him on my podcast, but he was like, um, you know, this is on camera, on air experience, just talking in front of a microphone and interviewing people. That's something you can include. And also, you know, obviously what you're doing with the radio. So I have been able to go back um, and listen. And that actually transitions me into my next question about internships. And, you know, I understand that you had a couple of internships. I did some research uh, in college with WJR and, of course, the Danbury Westerners, which I've heard about from uh, Cardi, I think, who also uh, interned with them. But can you just share with me what those experiences were like? Uh, and also just talk to me now that I'm kind of pursuing more of internships for this summer and also next fall. What is, you know, like the biggest thing you take away from an internship and like how important really is it? for the? Yeah, I, I think if you, if you walk away without an internship in college, um, you know, that, that sets you back a little bit. It really does. I think, you know, jumping on an internship and, and right now, honestly, is the time to start to think it's good that you're already starting to plan out your fall. It's, it's a good time to start to think about what you might do for this summer. You know, uh, yeah. there are a lot of um, great summer baseball leagues to take advantage of. You know, there's the NECBL, which the Westerners play in, the Ocean State Waves, Newport Gulls, a couple local teams play in. Um, there's also the Cape Cod League, which is highly regarded as the best uh, summer baseball league. You know, there's a bunch in the, uh, the area that you can really take uh, part of and it, it, those internships are really cool. My, I spent two years with the Westerners in the NECBL and they, you know, again, it's just a hands-on, learning environment and you're playing 40 I think we played 42 games in 49 days something crazy like that it's a high paced uh environment and you know when you're the broadcaster you're involved in every single game you're on the road with the team you're staying over with the team you're making five hour round trip bus trips with the team you know it, it's a it's a grind it's long it's hot. It's the middle of the summer. It's the legit dog days, but it's so important because as a student, right, you always have, you know, the little things going on, broadcasting here, writing articles here, got this meeting, that meeting. But when you're focused in an internship, you are in that specific business, right? You're working in that business. When I was with uh, NBC 10, in uh, Providence, they're technically in Cranston, working with the great Frank Carpano, Joe Kayata, and Tim McCone, all great uh, leaders, all great, um, you know, guys that I've looked up to and, and have followed. Uh, they, you know, they showed me what it's like to, to be hands on in a live newsroom, right? You're, you're talking about sports, but this is a moving environment. It's fast paced again. And, uh, you know, you do an hour, you know, full night's work. I probably spent, you know, four hours working, the other two prepping. You know, I'd spend six hours there in a, in a night. And, um, you know, just for what would be a five, six segment, six minute segment on air, right? And that happened twice in the entire night. So you're doing all this work for this, just this little part here. But it shows you what it takes uh, to, to be successful in that particular environment. So internships are super important because, it's a step away from the college life in that you kind of have a, a safety net going on there, right? You've got a bunch of different things going on. So you're not heavily involved in one particular thing. When you're in an internship, you're hands on. That's what you're focused on it, for whatever time length that is. If it's a summer internship, it's the length of the summer. If it's, you know, an internship while you're in semester, it's those couple of days that you go in for that time period. It's all that. So um, it's very important. It's very important. It adds that extra layer again to your growing resume, your dynamic full resume, getting an internship is very important. Yeah. I have to agree with that. Uh, it's been a little bit of a grind. I know the summer mm -hmm. internships haven't really been posted yet. I did apply to one of them. Uh, I think it was with CBS sports. Um, but yeah, a lot of them haven't been posted. I think it's mm -hmm. around, I mean, you would probably know, is it around January, February that they- Yeah, I mean, I, I want to say that I got my summer internship with the Westerners um, in early November. I, I want to say that they they jump on it early. So it just depends on where you're going, right? It just yeah. depends on what that particular organization does. Probably with, the, you know, the corporate entities like CBS, NBC, if you're going that route, you know, they're going to be very structured and, and have a, you know, deadline 
you know, date and then an open date from when you can apply to. But I think the biggest thing is when you're, when you're pursuing those is apply to um, a bunch of them, you know, just to see and, um, you know, take the ones that you think are going to be valuable to you. If you go into an internship and, and you, you don't really like it and not okay to necessarily pursue that field, right? You're still gaining valuable experience and you learn something about yourself, right? If you strike gold with a, an internship, not only are you gaining valuable experience, but you're also, you know, really putting in the time and the effort and the practice to get better in that particular field, right? In that particular niche. So that, that's an important thing to keep in mind is apply to a bunch of them, be persistent too. I would say the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? Follow up. And, um, you know, it, it's okay to have an internship that isn't you because then you, you know a lot more about yourself and you know what to pursue in the future. Yeah. You know, me being from Long Island um, in New York, I'm, I'm applying to a lot of those corporate uh, companies, mm -hmm. NBC, ESPN, Fox Sports, you know, I can name a couple of the local stations. Um, and I think it's a little bit more challenging because there aren't really baseball leagues, summer baseball leagues mm -hmm. out there. Um, and that is something that I do want to pursue. And, you know, I think something that I'm learning is that, you know, if you have to move in this industry to get that opportunity, it might be something that I have to potentially do down the road. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's definitely the early stage. Um, and I can definitely relate with, you know, something that I was not comfortable with and then, you know, kind of transitioning and something that now I am more comfortable mm -hmm. with. Originally, I was a sports media major and I was looking to pick up journalism as my second major. Right. Uh, and then originally I realized that not really trying to get into newspaper writing, it was mm -hmm. a little intense, a lot of politics, which is not really my speed, but, um, and it was just sports media and then just journalism. But I ended up picking up public relations, which is more of the social media, uh, being an SID, putting together meetings, putting together press conferences. That's something that is more of my speed. So I think right. two things from what you just said is one, kind of having a plan, always having a plan. Mm -hmm. um, and two, just kind of being okay with something that you're not comfortable with and then changing on the fly and adjusting so that you're able to become comfortable and find success in a different area. Because there's so absolutely. many avenues to go down. So I definitely agree with what you were just saying right there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's part of the business, right? You're going to have to learn on the fly and and think on your, you know, think on your feet, stay on your toes. And uh, again, it's good to have a plan, but that plan doesn't always work out. In fact, it, it rarely works out, but that's okay. That's part of the process. Absolutely. Uh, just a couple more questions, but what was a piece of advice that you received, whether that be in college, through internships, or just really in life uh, that still sticks with you today? That's a good one. I think, you know, um, I, I've heard a lot of, you know, encouraging words from professors who, you know, were, were very supportive of me. Obviously, again, you know, my support system here, my parents, my girlfriend, my sister, my, my family, who's was, was very large family, all very supportive. Uh, I, I've kind of put it all together, right, and, and crafted my own statement or my own mantra, and it's keep doing you right? Keep being you, keep doing you because um, I'm confident in myself and, and enough that I, I know where my skill set is. I know that I still have a lot of work to do and a lot of, um, you know, my foundation starting to be built, but if the job is not done yet, right, it's still an ever-changing process. So I, I think, you know, just taking everyone's little bits of advice is, is keep doing you because once you embrace that and once you say, you know, I'm, I'm me. This is my style. This is what I'm going to do. If you're confident in that, you're going to, you know, kind of take down, you know, any sort of uh, reservations that you might have and just push it yourself a little bit further. So uh, it's tough because there's, there's a lot that you will, you will hear from people. And um, I will say that I've had a lot of people, you know, just say little things and they're just, Hey, that was a great job. You know, thank you for everything you're doing for this organization. You know, I got a, re a parent reached out from an opposing team, emailed us and told you that the broadcast was one of the best we've ever heard from a college student. Those are the little things that you, that I've heard in my career that, you know, push me to the next level and say, keep doing me, keep doing me people like it as it is, right? I don't have to change, you know, who I am. I don't have to change what I'm about to, to be successful. I think that's the biggest thing is just being yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it's a little cliche, but I mean, that's 
from everyone I've asked that question to, that's what I've gotten. Uh, Stone said this on my podcast, but it really sticks with me. It's like, you just got to do. You just got to do what you got to do. And just do yeah. everything you can in your power. You know, just don't sit around and do nothing and go, go to class and come home, basically, and just do something like this. Um, spending, you know, a Monday, just sitting down, doing an interview, doing mm-hmm. a podcast. You go a long way because, you know, you never know, like, who's really looking at the work that you do. Um, and I think just, you know, hearing those compliments, that it was like small little feel good moments, you know, after I do a broadcast, it's just like, that was so cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I, even if it's from your mom, on the next one, right. But even yeah. if it's from your mom, it, it, make, it makes you feel, you know, all the more better and, and say, wow, you know, I'm doing the right thing here. I'm, I'm growing. And I, I right here, this is me. I'm going to keep doing that. Absolutely. Uh, so kind of transitioning to uh, your time in the, it's the NA three HL, right? So the North American yes. three yep. hockey league. Yeah. So a couple questions with that. So you were first the director of ticket sales and the color commentator for the hat tricks, Danbury hat tricks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you switched over to becoming the director of media relations and also just a broadcaster for the Bay state Bobcats. So what were those experiences like for you? And also what was that transition like going from the hat tricks, to the Bobcats, was it like challenging Kind of, I know they're not in the same division, but mm-hmm. in the same league, essentially being rivals, being able to transition from those two teams in two years. Yeah, it, it was um, working in minor league hockey, and, and the way that the hat the hat tricks um, organization structured is they now have three teams: one in the FPHL, which is like single A hockey; one in the NAHL, which is tier two hockey; and then the NA3HL, which is tier three. Um, it, it's very strong organization in that they have all three um, teams playing under one roof. Um, working in minor league hockey is, is is an animal, right? You're there every day. You're nine to five. You're working nine to six. Season starts. It's nine to seven. Um, you know, you get there on a Friday on a game day, nine o'clock, you're leaving at 11 o'clock at night after everything's all buttoned up and done. So um, it, it's great because it's so hands on and and you're working every day with the players. You know, I was involved in like community relations with the players going to different schools. We did, you know, uh, player readings at daycares and things like that. So it's cool to be um, develop those personal relationships every day with the players, be involved at the rink every single day. Um it was a it was a, a a transition for me actually more so getting the job as the director of ticket sales than it was going from that position to Bay State. Um, I had never really been involved in ticket sales at this time. I was I was very new to the the business aspect of a team, so I had to learn a lot. I had to you know jump through hoops and and figure my way out. Um, you know we had a very good support system. The ownership group there is very strong. And, um, you know, they, they gave me a lot of freedom with that position. They gave, they said, you know, this is what we were trying to accomplish, go get it done. And then I had to kind of figure it out, you know, from there to learn the ins and outs of, of the ticket sales business and how to be successful, you know, selling season tickets and, um, group tickets and, and premium suites and, and kind of figure it all out from there. Um, and then being able to, to broadcast on the side, you know, once my ticket sales duties were done, we got everyone through the doors. I'd run up to the booth and, and work alongside uh, two really good broadcast partners and, and Casey Bryant and Zach McGinnis. Uh, they, they were incredible, incredible uh, role models and, and teachers. They're both a little bit older than me um, and they've, they've had more experience than me. So learning from them was really, really a treat. And um, yeah, and then kind of that transition, I mean, COVID happened. And our season was cut short with the hat tricks. It was unfortunate too, because we were on a really good run. We were, uh, we won the Eastern division. Um, we, you know, we, we were on pace to, to likely win that, the championship that year. And, um, you know, COVID happened and it was tough, right? I, I was trying to figure out kind of my next step. Uh, my girlfriend has been living here in Providence for, you know, five years. And, and we were at that step where as, you know, in, in my personal life, I was ready to step in and, and move in together. And I said, you know, this might be a, a pretty good time. I wasn't sure, you know, how long this thing is going to last. Would I be able to come back you know, in the fall, with the rear season in the fall. Unfortunately, the hat tricks didn't play uh, this past fall. But um, I, I was starting to look around. I was starting to trying to figure out what I can do to to kind of supplement, you know, everything else that was going on. And and I know that the Bobcats they actually relocated from Elmira, New York. Um, that same year. And it was just kind of unfortunate timing that it happened during COVID, but they were in need of a broadcaster. I just reached out to to the head coach, uh, general manager, Anthony Longevin, who was 
very grateful that I, that I reached out and, and he was like, absolutely. We're going to take you on board. You'll be our, um, our director of media relations broadcaster and, and you'll, you know, run the show up there. And, um, you know, it was, it, again, it wasn't a huge transition for me because this was more of a, a part-time position, right? I was active on game days. I worked, I recorded and edited podcasts with the players, um, you know, did some stuff on social media, but it wasn't as, as heavy and as ingrained as, you know, the working the day, the day process, uh, you know, with the hat tricks, just, uh, beast the nature, um, you know, a three team doesn't need as much, you know, hands-on work, you know, on the Monday through Friday process as, you know, being in a ticket sales position type thing. So uh, the transition wasn't that hard. Uh, the The hardest thing really about that position was the hike. It was about an hour and a half from my apartment. Um, I was lucky to have close family where I could stay at kind of the halfway point, which was nice. But um, no, I, I really enjoyed that experience and, and was grateful that I could still work in the industry while the pandemic was happening. We hit a lot of bumps in the road couple of, you know, months where we didn't have any games, but we, uh, you know, we got through the season and it got kind of hectic in February. I think we had like 17 home games overall, like Tuesdays at noon and, you know, it was wild, but I, I was very grateful to, to, you know, be given that position broadcast during the pandemic and be given those positions, you know, really right out of school. I think it was three months after I graduated that I got the position in Danbury. So, um, you know, just, just grateful. And it's, it's a, it was a fun experience. Absolutely. Uh, I think what you said about just like making the most of the pandemic, mm -hmm. taking opportunities. And that's kind of like why I started this podcast. I mean, obviously, Zoom, we've utilized that so much. It's, mm -hmm. it's the new wave, I've been calling it. Um, but, you know, just to be able to kind of sit down with a microphone, a camera, and just reach out to people and interview. And I've been doing this for over a year now. I think just approaching a year since I've switched over to YouTube. But mm -hmm. first episode was like over a year. Um, I think it was last September. And I mean, every experience is different. Every interview is different, um, but I mean, just making the most of this opportunity and I've seen success with it, you know, certain episodes reaching more views, stuff like that, but mm -hmm. it's not only about that. It's kind of just enjoying, you know, wanting to do it, the enjoyment and the excitement after, you know, putting it into Adobe Premiere, editing it, posting it up to YouTube. I'm getting a lot of experience, like mm -hmm. producing, asking questions and also just reaching out to people. So there's a lot of different things that go into it. And I think that relates a lot to what you did in the NA3 EHL, being able to, you know, incorporate ticket sales, media relations, doing podcasts, of course, broadcasting, which was, you know, sort of your neck of the woods, being mm -hmm. able to pick up all these different skills and take on a, a new role, essentially, three months out of college. Uh, that's a huge opportunity. And, you know, you didn't necessarily create it for yourself, but you reached out and you were able to kind of get that. So that's something that's, uh, really amazing to see, especially during the pandemic, because that just threw everyone off. Uh, we weren't able to do a lot of the same WRIU broadcast last mm -hmm. year. Yeah. Um, Anchor Sports, I wasn't able to attend meetings in person, stuff like that. Um, everything was sort of remote like this. So being able to kind of still have that opportunity to work during the pandemic, uh, I give you a lot of credit because I've talked to a lot of people in the industry who you know, we're working mm -hmm. from home. They were doing broadcasts from home. There still are people doing broadcasts from home and it, yeah. it really sucks uh, where we are in the world and that that had to have occurred, but hopefully things are looking a lot better and the upside of things are starting to approach us soon and that everything in the past is in the past. So um, yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's incredible. Uh, the next question I have for you was, you know, what is the best game that you've called, whether that be in an NA three HL or, or just in WRIU or, in general, um, most memorable game you were a part of. Um, I know you've been calling games for a long time, so you yeah. can't really pinpoint one, but there's one game that comes to mm. mind that was just electric that you always remember. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember the uh, – gosh, there's so many good ones. The most recent one, I would say, for, for hockey was really good. It was um, we were in uh, a shootout. Uh, against one of our division rivals long beach and um this was like the fourth time we had uh taken them to the shootout like it was just a, a, a bizarre bizarre situation and uh this one kid on the team uh, his name's gordon ogden and he actually signed um a, a, an nil to play division one lacrosse 
So if this kid's just a freak athlete, he's an unbelievable athlete and uh, he's a defenseman and he's been pulling off this Henrik Zetterberg uh, um, just beautiful move um, around the goalie. And he did it three times already this season and he did it a fourth time. And I just remember the, the, the building was actually the biggest uh, crowd that night. We had a bunch of games coming in after. So there were, you know, kids who had never seen this, level of play before younger kids, their parents and everything. And the building's packed and uh, he pulls the move off again. And uh, it just, the, the roof goes off the place and, and he ended up, we ended up getting the save on the next play. And it was the most exciting point of the season for us. We didn't have a, a very successful uh, season in terms of win loss. And we, we were eliminated in the first round of the playoffs. Um, so that was kind of like the peak of the year. And, and it, it was, it was crazy just because he pulled the move off again. But I, I, I think my best, game where I was on the sideline for, I wasn't actually doing play by play. I was hosting for WRU during the, uh, the NCAA tournament. And uh, it was the game you or I played against Oklahoma and Trey young. Mm. And uh, it was the round of 64 again in Pittsburgh, Jared Terrell hit a, a three pointer from the logo uh, blew the roof off the place. There was a great Rhode Island contingent there. And then uh uh, EC Matthews hit a three on the ensuing inbound pass. Fats Russell stripped Trey Young, stepped back, hit a three in his mouth. The whole place was going nuts. Um, and, and this, of course, now Trey Young, he's he's a top 10 NBA player right now. I mean, he, he's an incredible athlete as well. So just to see that all happen in this big, bad Oklahoma, and, and little roadie takes them down, being on the sideline working, you know, that game, experiencing that game, that, that was tremendous. I'll never forget that game. I was a senior in high school and I was on the tennis team. But during March, I think everyone kind of just downloads the March Madness app and just watches oh, yeah. random games. Yep. I was already committed to URI. My dad went to URI. So I've been watching the program for a while. And I was rooting for them, of course, but I had driver's ed. And I remember I was in the car in the back seat. I wasn't driving at the time. That the <laughs> But I, you know, I don't think the, the guy next to me would have been happy about it. But no. I was in the back seat, and I remember my friend was like, "Oh, like Oklahoma is gonna win this game. Like Trey Young, he's great." And I was like, "Man, like mm -hmm. Rhode Island get upset them? Like, mm -hmm. you know, don't sleep on them." And I and I've been following the program for a while. So Terrell, you see Matthews, um, Hassan Martin, you know, all all those guys, Fats Russell. And then I remember like before practice coming back into the school turning on the game and that was when uh the sequence happened where it was fat scored the point uh trey young got the ball he stole the ball back step back three it was, just, it was crazy i was going yeah. crazy and everyone was like why are you cheering for rhode island like we're in new york yeah. well, what is this like it's not you know it's it's nothing mm -hmm. but i was that was still i wasn't necessarily at that game but oh my god i wish i, I have goosebumps just like talking about it i feel like the energy in that building when that happened was probably insane. It was great. And, and you see at those tournaments, like the neutral fans, right? Somebody who's not really rooting for one team or the other. As the game goes on, they pick a team to root for. And that game, it was basically everyone was rooting for Rhode Island because they were yeah. like, hey, we, they have a chance to, to knock off Trey Young. And again, big bad, right. go, big, bad Oklahoma. So you started to feel the energy building. And that was just kind of the pinnacle. And it was it was really cool. And now I now so I'm from New York, so I'm a Knicks fan. So I, I hate Trey Young even more now. Yeah. Well. <laughs> um, but uh and also um what was it? I remember the last game I went to pre-COVID was the game before spring break, my freshman year, when we got mm -hmm. blown out by Dayton and Obi Toppin pretty much just took over the Ryan Center. Yeah. And now I love him because he's a New York Knicks. Right. So, right. There you go. I just had to throw that out there. But mm -hmm. you know, got to see both those guys play in college and now mm -hmm. one of them I hate. One of them that I once hated, I now love because he's yeah. on. So don't you love how that just happened? Yep, it's but, crazy, uh, right? That's the world of sports. <laughs> exactly. All right, so I have one more question for sure. you. Um, you're back at the University of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about what you're doing now with Spectra. Um, Spectra, right? Yes, yeah. So what mm -hmm. you're doing now with Spectra, your role essentially 
um, and your certain responsibilities that you hold at the, the Ryan Center? Yeah, sure. So um, Spectra is the, the venue management company that that runs the Ryan Center, essentially. It's owned by the University of Rhode Island, but we are the company that that takes care of everything and from everything from operations engineering to, um, you know, the food and beverage services to uh, ticket sales. We're heavily involved uh, with the, the athletic department kind of intertwined. It's a really cool system that they have there. And uh, my role as senior account executive is directly involved with with ticket sales again and it, it's uh you know season tickets we sell our mini plans for men's and women's basketball um we sell uh premium suites for both football and basketball we sell uh group tickets is, is one of our big targets as well so it's it's uh bringing in you know the, the fans and, and giving them kind of the gateway to get into the games right that's that's how i kind of uh, see our our position and, and finding new ways to to bring in uh fans and, and creative ways to to bring in fans we have a lot of um fun activities and we call them assets that we offer and um you know you'll see them from time to time at the ryan center the the halftime performances the uh the tunnel teams the kids that are high five in the rams as they run out onto the court that's us right we we coordinate that we sell those uh, those assets to uh to youth groups and organizations in the area and, um you know we've got a, a large contingent of you know, different uh, programs, organizations at the university who do group nights and things like that. So we, we are, are heavily involved in that factor. And, and I have to say, I've been there now, uh, this is uh, actually three months tomorrow, funny enough. And it's been a, an incredible, incredible um, timeline because we're, we're so hands-on. Um, you know, yesterday or two days ago now, we're, we're there on the football field for the final play of that game. You know, I'm watching, I'm walking back down towards the field and LB Mack scoops up a, a block pump from Andre Bivolt to, to basically clinch that game, get the game winning touchdown. And I'm just like, holy cow. That was to call. I was on play by play for that. That was so fun. That's, that's <laughs> just the pinnacle. Yeah. And, uh, you know, roadie football, they're having a, a magical year anyway. Uh, uh, but it's a, it's a very fun position in that I'm involved in athletics and I'm still doing some stuff on the side. I've, I've done some public dress work for them, which is really cool. Uh, both men's and women's soccer, volleyball as well. So um, just to be back uh, at URI is, is such an incredible experience. And I'm, I'm grateful again for the opportunity for the folks at Spectra and, and URI, the Ryan Center. Um, for, for letting me come back and, and giving me this opportunity to work with them. It, it's been incredible. And it, it's not broadcasting, but I'm okay with that because I know that this is, this is a huge step uh, for me professionally. And um, again, to be involved in my second home, which has now become my first home and uh, you know, to, to be back there, it's just, it's just truly incredible. And I, get, I can't be thankful enough and, and, and I'm bracing every opportunity that I have with them. That's amazing. Um, excited for you. I know a lot of Thank things you. are going to come out of that opportunity. It sounds like you're really happy in this position. So uh, I'm very excited yes. for you and, and what you guys are going to do there. Uh, but thank you again for taking the time uh, to connect with me and, of course, do this. Uh, hopefully I can uh, meet you in person sometime, whether yes. it's on campus or in the Ryan Center or whenever. We'll, we'll stay in touch. Uh, I'll definitely be picking your brain soon um, about some more broadcasting things just in general about the media. Uh, industry, anything like that. But uh, best of luck going forward. And of course, go roadie. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate you having me on. Yes. Reach out if you need anything. I'd be happy to help. And um, looking forward to seeing where, uh, where your travels take you next, right? You've got a lot of bright things ahead of you. So keep grinding, keep the process going, trust the process. Uh, this is a great uh, platform that you've built, this really Rumble podcast. I've seen the, the guests that you've had on. It's a, it's a very strong list, so keep that up. And, uh, yes, go Rhodey. We'll see you around town. All right. You stole that one from Stone, didn't you? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I eat the head up and spit it right back. So Hilarious like bullets, I'm shooting your ass. Women come and go with the cat. You gon' learn and learn that shit fast. They gon' fold, fold them to ass. I get my medicine straight out the bag. I'm a prospect, no.